we then thereby have seen a lot of quantum algorithms for classical problems. So everybody then likes to ask, what about some more quantum algorithms for classical problems? You know, you might think to yourself, okay, cool, I learned in this class, like, three algorithms, but did I really learn, like, the principles that I can use to, like, design future quantum algorithms for, like, the classical problems I might encounter? And, uh, yeah, as, as I said you know, at the beginning, I'm sorry I can't give that to you because, I don't know, like, we don't really have more cool quantum algorithms for classical problems. So the good news is like, oh great, you've seen them all. Like you're now up to date on everything humanity knows about quantum algorithms for classical problems. Now, uh, some people may take offense at this claim that I said this. You know, that I said like, okay, after Grover and Shor's algorithm from the mid '90s, like we haven't gotten anything. And people, some people will say like, no, 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 like you've, you're really selling things short. There's so many other uses of quantum algorithms for solving classical problems, like, what about this? What about that? And they'll point to some things, which we didn't discuss in this class. But I kind of personally feel they all have some issues. So the things that people will point to, they all have some kind of, like, downsides, if you will. One is that, like, they're very, like, modest speed-ups. So one thing that people work on, which I think is a good thing to work on, but uh, it's not so amazing, is like trying to really squeeze these like square root type speedups in like different contexts. Like where can we use these, like Grover type ideas to get some kind of speedups for interesting problems? And there are some things like this. For example, pretty recently there was like a 1.7 to the n time algorithm for quantum algorithm. Uh, for a traveling salesperson problem. Okay, whereas the fastest classical algorithm we know is two to the n time. So it's again, it's like, well, it's not even 1.4 to the n, but it's a speed up for like a famous problem. Even this has some caveats. Like there's like some where you like you have to assume that like there's some special quantum version of RAM that it's not clear why it should exist. But anyway, even ignoring these caveats, you're like, that's cool, but like, okay, it's still 1.7 to the n time. Or people will be like, oh, you know, I got like a cool speed up, an exponential speed up for some other problem, but like, it'll be like a problem that's extremely obscure. Like it'll be kind of this thing where like almost like the problem was invented because you got a speed up for it. Or like, it'll have like no obvious practical utility. So okay, you're still exploring the, 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 the space, but it's not clear what it's good for. Or there's some algorithms where, like, it looks good. Like, it's an exponential speed up for an important problem. And, you know, you're like, oh, that sounds good. But, you know, there's always, like, some fine print. So I'll give an example. Probably the most famous quantum algorithm uh, for classical problem we didn't discuss in this course is called the HHL algorithm. Uh, came out, I don't know, in the mid-2000s. And it's an algorithm for solving systems of linear equations. Like, you got AX equals B, you want to find X. And that sounds good. That's a very famous problem. And um, people who are really into, like, the potential of, like, um, quantum algorithms for machine learning, like, really like to hang on to this problem because they're like, oh, like, solving systems of linear equations, like, we do that a lot in machine learning. It's kind of funny to me because we do that a lot in, like, every aspect of computing, from like graphics to robotics to algorithms. But okay, yeah, you do it a lot in machine learning too. And it does have an exponential speed up for this problem, but there's somehow like a million caveats. Like the matrix has a special form, and you have to somehow get like the B and AX equals B into a quantum state, and you don't actually get the solution X, you only get to sample from the solution X. And like somehow, like every time people have tried to use it, like as an ingredient in solve, like actually solving a natural problem you might care about, when they figure out how to like overcome the fine print, 
they get into a situation where there's a classical algorithm that can also solve the problem exponentially faster. So basically, although it looks cool, like we don't know any actual setting where you can use this algorithm to solve a problem faster than basically a classical algorithm can do it. And like the only setting where we know it is like some like obscure setting where like we don't know how to like how that would ever arise. So that's kind of sad. Or uh, another possibility is that the algorithm is heuristic. What do I mean by that? It means like people don't prove this algorithm works. They just say like, well, this is an algorithm, and it might work if you tried it. And for most of these algorithms, in fact, you can prove that it doesn't work on all inputs. So from a theoretical point of view, it's just it doesn't work. It's like not a correct algorithm for the problem it's supposed to solve. Now, you could say that like, well, that's okay. You know, like, for example, in the fields of machine learning or in the fields of SAT solving, people will just like, run an algorithm, a heuristic algorithm, that they know cannot solve every single problem, learning algorithm they want to solve, or every single SAT solve problem they want to solve. But they're like, well, I ran it on my problem, and it worked great. And that's, that's cool. Yeah, there's lots of successes like that. So maybe some of these quantum algorithms will have this property that when you actually run them, they'll like do something great for like optimization. Trouble is, we don't have any quantum computers right now, so we can't try them. And we'll have to see when quantum computers come if they do anything good. For now, all that we can do is study them theoretically. And sadly, the theorems all say that like things like, well, they don't work in every case. But maybe they'll work in some cases. Or... Maybe, you know, they don't yet exist. That's another possibility. Like maybe, okay, it's been like maybe 30 years since we had like a really compelling quantum algorithm for a classical problem. But maybe we'll look up tomorrow and somebody will think of like a new one. It could happen. I don't know. It's been 30 years, but yeah. Keep the dream alive. Okay, so this leads us back to like maybe a, a question that you know, seems like a downer way to end. Like... Why study quantum computing, then? And I don't know. I'll answer with like the same answers I gave maybe in lecture one, where I was warning you of this sad situation. <laughs> uh, one reason is, you know, I was really careful here to say, you know, I'm not too excited about more quantum algorithms for classical problems. but. One thing that's the subject of, I think, a lot of research and what I mostly work on and I'm excited about is quantum algorithms for quantum problems. So, like, what about problems where the input is qubits? Like, you get some quantum sensor data you want to process, it, or the input is like a, a, like a molecule in, like, a quantum state, and you want to, like, optimize it. Or what about, like, problems where the output is, like, qubits? Like, you want to create, like, a quantum encryption of classical data, or you want to, you know generate qubits in like a very useful entangled state. These are like algorithms problems that like you can't even talk about in the world of classical computing. They like transcend like P and NP. They're not even about like classical bit strings. So I think this is like a cool new world of you know algorithms problems to study. And so like even if they're not problems that like you've heard of, like factoring or SAT, well they're different problems. And there's lots of cool things you can think about there. And uh the other reason I'll just end on is like, well, you know, I'm a theoretical computer scientist. So like what really motivates me, I mean, I'm very happy that quantum is relevant for engineering and life, maybe, but, you know, I'm motivated by this like 251 type stuff. Like, you know, what is the fundamental nature of computation? And, you know, the laws of the universe are quantum mechanical. So we have to understand how quantum mechanics affects computation. And I always kind of, there's something like truly amazing about quantum computing that I really, like every day I wake up and like feel amazed by it. Uh, and I, like imagine like, imagine it's like 1994 or something and like I'm a class, theoretical computer scientist and I'm like, you know, go to a party and I like meet a science fiction writer. And the science fiction writer is like, hey, I've got this cool idea for a science fiction premise. Like it's like the laws of physics are going to like allow us to do a whole new mode of computation. Like, that has never been done before. And I would be like, oh, yeah, so what? Like, you can solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time with it? And the science fiction writer's like, no, no, no. Like, it won't be able to do that. And then I'll be like, but then how is this science fiction? Like, are you just not going to be able to do anything with this, like, new form of computation? 
And the science fiction writer would be like, no, 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 you can do something like new. And then I'd have to like really rack my brains as a theoretical computer scientist. I'd actually have to use my knowledge to be like, what could possibly be intermediate between, you know, solving NP-complete problems and doing nothing? And I'd be so skeptical. I'd be like, what are you going to like have like a this new form of computation? What is it going to solve SAT not in polynomial time, but it's going to solve it in sub-exponential time? Or like among all the thousands and thousands of problems out there, like there's one NP intermediate problem. What is this new computation going to solve that exactly that one problem? Factoring? And like that's exactly what happened. Like it's unbelievable. Like it's mind boggling that like this new form of computation that's possible in our universe exactly thread the needle. Like it's unbelievable that it did some things, but not everything. So yeah, just quantum computation is, you know, it's unbelievable and mind boggling. And so this is why I think you can study quantum computing. Uh, okay, that's it. Um, I'll see you at the exam. Thanks.